Thessalonians chapter 3. This is lesson number 3. Trying to get through one chapter at a time, not making any promises. Sometimes I like to slow the pace down, but that's where we're at. 1 Thessalonians is uh, authored by Paul. He is, uh, he had pastored, or I shouldn't say pastored, he had founded this church uh, just for a couple of months. Ends up getting run out, run out of town by <coughs> some unhappy uh, Jewish religious leaders. And he had some concerns about that church. Uh, tonight we'll see that they send some representatives there. And he ends up getting some pretty good news about the church. So that kind of catches us, us up a little bit. Uh, but we're going to look at that tonight. Uh, really, <coughs> Paul's going to talk quite a bit here about, you know, uh, suffering for the kingdom. It's not a, not a fun topic, but it is truth. Uh, and sometimes we do suffer for uh, the kingdom, but as the disciples would say, it would be an honor to suffer for the Lord. So uh, that's what we're looking at tonight. So let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming tonight, being here in person. And those who are joining by Facebook Live and Later may join us through some other uh, social media. Let's read verses 1 through 3. Therefore, anytime you see a therefore, you need to find out what the therefore is there for, by the way. Uh, that usually ties back to the previous chapter. And we've already studied that, uh, but uh, remember that when you are studying, that it's important. Anytime you see a word like therefore, or but, something that is considered a tie-in to the previous chapter, uh, it's important to go back and look at that. Uh, tonight we're not going to do that in, in full, but we are going to be discussing some a few of the things that we kind of began to talk about last week and the previous week. So, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. By the way, notice this is in the plural. Do we remember who uh, helped Paul here in Thessalonians? Who's a part of his team? Do you remember? Silas and Timothy and Paul working together. Uh, I, I think that's awesome. I think that's what we uh, need to be doing is working with each other and working as teams. So... <clears throat> Therefore, when we could no longer do it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy. That's one of your questions. So they sent Timothy to go ahead uh, to Thessalonica and check things out. Our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. To establish you and to, and to encourage you concerning your faith. So notice here. Right away in these first three verses, number one, I'm answering two or three questions uh, by just simply the text. So Timothy was sent ahead, and he had an assignment. And it's spelled out here. His assignment is to establish them. It's a twofold uh, assignment. Establish them and encourage them concerning their faith. So that's his assignment. Uh, and then it goes on to say that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. So they're sending Timothy ahead to establish. What does the word establish mean? What, what does it make you think of when I say Timothy is sent ahead to establish this church? Lay a foundation. Good. Uh, to uh, kind of set the groundwork, so to speak, right? And to get things established, using that word. Uh, and to encourage. How many knows uh, churches and people just need encouragement, right? Uh, so that no one should be shaken. That spells out the purpose. Not the assignment, but the purpose is so that nobody is shaken by the things that they're experiencing. Uh, <clears throat> this was new baby church 
and Timothy is going ahead and he has an assignment to lay a foundation or to establish a foundation to encourage them with the purpose that uh, nobody's going to be shaken. In other words, they're not going to be uh, the, the point is that they won't be tempted to quit, won't be tempted to leave the church, uh, won't be tempted to leave their uh, relationship with the Lord. That's important, right? Uh, anytime new Christians uh, are involved, they need to be a part of the church, right? They need to find a church. Uh, I have had people, don't throw rocks at me, but I've had people come here uh, with, uh, you know, and get saved, and then in talking to them, I find out that they've got friends and family in another church that I deem is a pretty good church, and I have told people, you might want to go there. You're welcome here, but how many knows that you need ties to stay in a church? You've got to form relationships and friends and, and those ties. And if they can't be done, it's more important for them to grow in their faith than it is for them to be in Cross Point Church. Do we want new people? Absolutely. Uh, but the most important thing is they stay connected to the Lord, right? Uh, so don't throw rocks at me. I haven't ran too many off by, by doing that, right? For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. So Paul is saying we're appointed to do this work there in Thessalonica. This, uh, to, to help this church, to lead this church. So they sent Timothy ahead. Uh, and the point is that there is a lot of tribulation and trials that are going on. Uh, there is a lot of persecution that's going on during this time, uh, and it's likely that some of them could be discouraged. Some of them could uh, not have the proper foundation that they need. I mean, I was, uh, you don't expect babies to get up and feed themselves, do you? I, I babysat my little granddaughter today, and when she started crying, there was two things I was looking for. Did she have a wet or a dirty diaper, or was she hungry? And if those two things were met for her, she was smiling, she was happy. Uh, but there are things that baby Christians need. We can't expect them to know everything for themselves. How do we help? Let me ask you a question. Not in your notes. How do we help establish new Christians? What's some thoughts? Love them. Oh, absolutely. And involve them. Involve them. Okay, good. What else? <clears throat> How about teach them? How about teach them to study for themselves? Right? Uh, because many times we teach people, but we don't really teach them how to study for themselves. And, and that's important. Uh, how about, you know, form relationships with them so that when they do struggle, then they've got somebody to call on, right? Uh, and I think, honestly, I think this is one of the number one problems of not just our church, because I've seen this happen. I've seen people come in and get saved, and then before too long, they haven't formed relationships, and maybe it's because we weren't reaching out like we ought to, uh, and then before too long, we're no longer. The onus is on both parties, right? Uh, <clears throat> but people, when they're young, in the Lord, need to be taught. Need to be taught how to read the Bible, how to find what's a good Bible, what's a good version for me to read. What book, how, has anybody ever asked you this when they got saved? What book should I read first? Right? What's your answer? John. 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 Well, pretty much a common uh, answer that we give them. Why? It tells them that what is it? Stay a Christian. <laughs> it tells about love. God so love. It tells about salvation. Uh, it gives the gospel message, right? It tells about Jesus uh, fulfilling everything that needed to be fulfilled in order to be considered, and he was not just considered, but to be the 
Christ, right? The Savior of the world. So that's a good book, and it's, uh, other than the first chapter, it's pretty easy to read. Uh, the first chapter has, like, just loaded down in the first 14 verses with, like, uh, 14 different theological concepts. So, uh, but it's a good book to read. And it talks all about, you know, uh, John doesn't leave out the cross. He doesn't leave out uh, the blood of Christ. He doesn't leave out any of those essential things. So that's a good way to do it. So that's one way that we can be involved in helping establish people and encourage. How do you encourage somebody? A Christian. How do you encourage them? I think these are common questions that we need to know. How, how do we encourage somebody to continue on in their faith? Pray. By examples. By examples? Pray on them. Pray, pray, what? Pray on them. Pray on them. Oh, yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't understand for a second what you were saying. Yes. Acknowledge them. Just brag on them and say, hey, man, I'm so glad you're here. You've been, you've been here three weeks in a row. Man, I've noticed you. You look like you're getting, you got your Bible with you. You look like you're involved and engaged. People need to hear that kind of stuff. I wonder how many times we really do that, right? Uh, so, and you guys are a core part of the church, so that's something that we can do that's real simple and real, uh, I think, easy, but to encourage people uh, in their faith. What about if we're going through a problem? How do you encourage somebody who's going through a problem? They come to the, can I tell you that most of the time people, I don't know, I'm going just way off my notes, but I feel like we need this. Why do most people come to church and get saved? Because they got a problem. Because they got a problem. Something's going on in their life. Uh, it's not, not usually that whenever they're at, they're at the peak of their life, they got all the money they need, they're in the peak of health, that people come to church and get saved. Truth is truth. Many times people come when they're discouraged. There's been uh, things happen in their life. They're at a pivotal point. And so we need to make sure that we're encouraging them. Paul said, we thought it was good for us to stay in Athens. But they sent Timothy. Why would Paul say it's good for him to stay in Athens instead of going to Thessalonica? Think about what we know what happened to Paul in Thessalonica. He was ran out of town. So uh, would it be good for Paul immediately to go back to this church and, and, and enter into it and possibility that another uprising could happen and all that kind of thing? So they kind of sent Timothy in who most time people characterize as a little bit softer in nature. I'm not talking negatively about him, but Paul had a tendency to be very bold and very brash in the way he spoke. Uh, he kind of reminds me of Peter a little bit, right? Uh, so they sent Timothy in to try to get things uh, heading in the right direction. Uh, <laughs> they call him a brother and a minister of God. Uh, that word minister there doesn't mean pastor. As a matter, it, it means servant. So we uh, we call min pastors ministers and ministers pastors, and uh, but this is a kind of a common word. Uh, it's not wrong to call a pastor a minister because he's a servant. It's not, and it's actually on, at times it's okay to call some of you ministers because of what you're doing. If you're ministering, if you have a, uh, a ministry that you work in, uh, then you are ministering, right? You're serving. Uh, so that, that's important. And originally, guess what that word originally was denoted for? Minister. It's not going to be what you think. It's kind of more serving than because they were serving. Yeah. How about a table waiter? That, that's written, that's what it was. So when we go back and we, I'm, I'm, off the, I'm not off the subject, but I'm giving you an example. Acts. When the, the apostles.
apostles come and say, it's not going to be good for us to be waiting on tables. They literally meant waiting on tables, making sure that people had food, making sure that they're helping the elderly and they're helping the widows and the orphans. And, and it's not because they couldn't minister, but there was people who could effectively do that and help and then help the church by allowing the apostles to be in what? Two things. Do you remember? They said we should be in what? Prayer. I can see you whispering it. What else? What else? What's the two things in apostles? The word. The word. Prayer and the word. So here they're sending Timothy and they're using this word that talks about waiting on tables. That's commonly how it's introduced. Do we really understand how much of a servant we're to be in the kingdom? Like, uh, let me give you an example. That is not from the kingdom of God, but it happened to be at the workplace, and uh, not just me, but it, we had a manager who would walk out on the production floor, and he would bring a pocket full of pennies with him, and he would throw one in behind a beam. He would throw one in an inconspicuous place. He would drop one or two here and there. Why? To see if people were cleaning, to see if people were sweeping, to pe see if people uh, were, I'm going to use a, a Christian word, ministering, right? Uh, and that wasn't even a Christian person. I'm telling you, they definitely were not. Uh, <laughs> uh, not with the grace that they gave me. Anyway, uh, so we are to be ministers. I'm going down this road, but I'm going to keep on going. Okay? So if you, let's just get real. If you walk into church and you see a piece of paper laying in the aisleway or under a pew, what do you do? Pick it up. Pick it up is the right answer. What you don't do is say, well, somebody else should do that. The janitor should do that, right? That, that's not the correct answer because we're all ministers, right? Uh, so and we're to establish and encourage. Some of the ways that we establish and encourage people is that we help out where we need to, right? Uh, that, so that nobody will be shaken uh, by their afflictions. Timothy is put to work uh, to help the people the church there in Thessalonica. Uh, and he was appointed to do that. We think about in the church that somebody's appointed to be a pastor, appointed to be a teacher, appointed to be a deacon, appointed to be a department director. I don't know. But there's much more to it than that, right? We're all appointed to serve. However, whenever, wherever, right? Uh, we're appointed uh, to serve. Yeah. Let's read verses, verse four. For in fact, we told you before, he said, I told you so, don't you hate to hear that? <laughs> I told you so. He said, for in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know. Right? So the message that uh, is coming to them is that we told you when we were first there that you're going to suffer some persecution, and now you have realized that. Not brag. He's not saying it in a bragging way. He's saying it happened. Uh, it's a part. You know, that 
persecution and tribulation is actually a part. Thank God it's not the whole part of Christianity, but it is a part of Christianity. Because we're not supposed to look like and act like and feel like and do everything else like the world. Right? If you can't tell the difference between you and the world, then we need to go back and let the Lord sharpen us, right? And help us. Uh, so we told you when we were with you that you would suffer tri tribulation. Uh, so he was concerned that the tribulation would cause them to fall away. You remember the parable of the, so the soils? Four different kinds of soils. He was concerned that some would fall away when they had tribulation or persecution. That they would, when they were tested in that manner, that they would fall away from the Lord. This message is good for us too. Even though most of us have been in the faith for a long time and been a Christian for a long time, persecution is a part and tribulation is a part of that. So we don't need to let it get us totally down, right? To where that we're weary, so weary, uh, that we're considering walking away from the Lord. And I tell you, I didn't come too far now. It's too far to go back. I don't have anything to go back for, right? Uh, but uh, that's what Paul is telling them here. That you're going to be tested, but there is uh, a way made for you. Verse 5. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent it, I sent to you to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. So imagine Paul. He's founded this church. Now he has to go away because he seems too uh, fiery. He seems too much. He needs to go away. Uh, to let things settle down, he sends Timothy uh, there in his place. Uh, he couldn't stand it any longer, so he sends Timothy to check on the people because he was worried that the tempter, who's the tempter? Satan. The devil, right? Satan. The tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. Back a chapter or so ago, we said that there was something that kept Timothy, not Timothy, kept Paul from going back to Thessalonica initially, and that was Satan. Kept him from being able to go, right? And here he's saying, I'm worried that since I haven't been able to be here, that if you've been tempted by the devil, then you've considered falling away from the Lord. And he doesn't want them to fall away. Uh, and that everything that they had done would be in vain. Wouldn't that be disheartening? Uh, can I tell you that that is a very disheartening situation? I don't know if you've ever, <laughs> in the faith, put time and effort into helping someone really know the Lord and raise them up and to have them fall away is disheartening is not even a word. Uh, it, it just Has anybody ever had that happen? Yeah, yeah, we got some people shaking their heads. Some people. Totally disheartening, right? Uh, and that's what, that's where Paul was at. Uh, he couldn't, he couldn't, uh, didn't want to think about that any longer. But the good news is verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to you, or come to us from you, and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. So Timothy showed up with some good news, right? By the way, the, word, the words good news are the exact same words that's used for gospel throughout most of the New Testament. It's the only place here where it literally means doesn't mean the gospel, it mean, means just simply good news. Right? Uh, like, wow, that was 
some good news. I was real. And have you ever been really worried about something? And then you receive good news. That's what, that's what Paul was here. He was worried this church and the people in it were going to fail and uh, fall away from God. But he found dip out differently, right? So it's good news that they, uh, they still have faith. They still have love. And that, guess what? They would like to see us. Isn't that awesome? Paul's like, yes! I'm gonna, uh, they're doing good. We've established them well. We, we encouraged them just what little bit of time that we were there. And now Timothy's gone back for this work, but they're doing well. That's awesome, right? Uh, good news for sure, and that they would like to see us. You ever had some good friends you like to see? You know, they, they live away. They, uh, you don't get to see them too often, but uh, you get to see them. Uh, this past, what was it? Monday, uh, Clara came into town, and she had a little one with her. A little, uh, oh, Nehemiah. And we got to see her, and we got to talk with her, and then, then I got to hold, I'm the baby whisperer, by the way, uh, <laughs> if I haven't told you that before, and I got to hold little, little Nehemiah and rock him to sleep, and uh, Claire said that I did such a good job that he slept the whole three hours on the way back. <laughs> so, uh, but that was enjoyable to get to see her, right? That's where Paul's at here. He's like, man, I gotta, I gotta get there. I gotta see these people. I remember Brother John. I remember Sister Sue. I remember, you know, I, they probably didn't have names like that then, but maybe John, uh, but probably not Sue. Uh, but anyway, they had all kinds. Uh, he was excited to see some of these people again, uh, and it was a good memory for him. Right? Let me know your memory is extremely powerful. Your memory has the power to take you from just blah to ecstatic the deepest darkest blues memory is very powerful right uh, so we need to, we need to understand that but Paul was excited uh, about that and that they would like to see him and uh, he would like to see them verses seven through nine. We were comforted concerning you by your faith, for now we live. Wow. Paul said, I was about to die because I couldn't handle the thought that maybe all you guys had fell away from the Lord. He said, but now we live. Isn't that awesome? You're talking about, he had a great, you know, we think about how much an administrator Paul was because he's starting all these churches and he's putting pastors in place and he's putting uh, ministry teams into place but do we really think about the love that Paul had for these people? He said, man, I can, I can live now because I know that you're alright. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. As long as you're staying with the Lord I'm good. That's what he's saying. For what, for what thanks can we render to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before God? So in other words, Paul's saying, I'm excited about it and I, I can't even thank God enough for this. You ever had God be so good to you you just didn't know how to thank him for something? Yeah? He's, he's a good God. Let's go to verse 10. When you really have a heart for people and you really have a heart to minister to people, I'm not just talking about being a pastor, I'm talking about ministering to people, then you'll pray for them. Right? When you when you really love people, you'll pray for them. And that's what we're going to see. That's what Paul's doing. He's praying for the Thessalonians. 
says night and day, praying exceedingly. So he's not just praying a little bit, but praying night and day exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. So what are the two things that uh, he wants to do here? See them and, and stir up their faith. It says, and perfect what is lacking. So is he going to make them perfect? Isn't that what that says? It is what it says, but it's not really what it means, right? What does the word perfect mean in this biblical context? Are any of us perfect? Are any of us perfect in our faith? No. For sure. What does the word mean? It means complete. Not lacking anything. doesn't mean we always act perfectly or even have perfect faith, but we're complete. God's done a work in us. We're complete. Our faith has led us to the Lord. Our faith is causing us to continue on with the Lord. Uh, so he's saying that's complete. That's perfect. Doesn't mean you don't continue to grow in your faith. Doesn't mean you don't continue to uh, grow in your walk with the Lord. But God has made you complete. Right? Not anything lacking that would prevent you from having the relationship with God that you need. Right? So we're gonna, we want to come and perfect what is lacking in you. You've got some room to keep growing. Who does it? Amen? Isn't that why we meet here? So we can keep growing? I don't know if you know it or not. I tell people this, but I don't know if they really believe me. When I get here and I teach and I ask you guys questions or you make comments or you do things like that, I learn from that. So it's, it's not like I have all the answers. It's not like I don't learn anything. Uh, if, if you've ever taught, baby, Yeah, all, all those in here who have taught, Danny's taught, if you've ever taught, you will know that you learn much more when you're teaching than when you're just sitting back and learning. And so I'm, I'm learning along with you. Uh, and Paul thought that his personal presence would be a help to the Thessalonians because he was there. Can see what's going on. How many knows it's important to be there? It really is. It's important to be there. There's only certain things that you can do well from a distance. It takes interpersonal relationships. Right? We grow from our relationships. Sometimes we become more holy because we've sharpened one another. You ever take a file and sharpen an axe or sharpen a tool? How I many have done that? Yeah, and it don't go one way. I used to think it was one way. Uh -huh. I sharpened holes a lot. Uh -huh. You sharpen that tobacco. Mm -hmm. You sharpen that hole one way, you turn it over, and you sharpen it the other way. So Both of them coming together. Oh, that's sharpen good. Sharpen one another. That's good. That's good. And they come to a point and they're yeah. sharp. Yeah. Right? And that's what we do for one another. And sometimes there's a lot of scraping. <laughs> and I'm talking about relationships here too, right? Because sometimes we grow each other because we're a little rough on the edges sometimes, and, but we help each other, right? We don't always know what we need to be scraped of. Oh, that's very true. If you get a hoe or a, or a, uh, a tool that you've used in your garden uh, and you haven't sharpened it in a while and it'll have dirt on it that'll be built up, it'll have rust on it, nicks and places that need to be smoothed. So uh, it's important for us to be face-to-face. -face. I appreciate the technology that we have back here in the back. 
that we can, when people are sick, when people just simply can't make it, sometimes people are traveling out there, heard, had people say, well, I've done it myself. I was waiting to get on a cruise ship. I was sitting in uh, the a hotel. We were going to get picked up. I watched the service in the hotel room. And it was good. You know? I appreciate that, but it doesn't make up for what we need when, when we're in interpersonal here, connecting to one another. Uh, so if you can be here, I'm saying this, I'm preaching to the choir. That's what they always say. Because you're all, all here. But those who are watching online who could be here, uh, you need to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank the Lord you made it. You didn't have to. Have to yeah. No conviction. No conviction for that. Yes. All right. Let's scoot on down to verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. What's Paul praying for here? Yeah, he's saying, God, work it out so I can get there, right? So we, not just him, but him and his team can all get there, right? Do you ever pray like that? I remember going on vacations with big groups of people. And before we left, I don't know if y'all ever done this or not, but we'd get outside the car before we left and we'd pray. And we'd say, God, help us. Protect us. Keep our cars safe. Keep the people safe. Go before us. Go behind us. Surround us. You know, all those things. I mean, people get that. There'd be such a power of the Lord coming there that sometimes people almost get saved. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding>. uh, <laughs> but you ought to do that. No, we don't think about that, right? Yeah, it's a it's a great practice to do that. That's what Paul's doing here. He's saying, "Help us to get to them, direct our way." Do you ask the Lord to direct your way when you get up in the morning? That's a good practice to start. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's better than twenty five seventy five, right? Uh, so it's important for us to ask the Lord to direct our paths, to help us, uh, to uh, help us to follow Him. We can always follow our own path, but we want to follow the path that the Lord lays out for us. Do you ever pray, God? I want you to open up some doors for me today that only You can open up. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Did you follow it up with walking through the door? Did you do it? Did you apply it? Because it's real easy to ask God to do that and then shy away from the opportunity and the door that he opened up for you. A wise prayer. Now, I'm not saying I pray this all the time. I'm just saying these are some things that I pray, somehow that I pray, is ask God to open up doors of opportunity for me that day, and then help me to realize that that's what that is. Because I think sometimes we walk right by open doors, and we're in our routine. If I was preaching right now, I'd say, I'm a preach, right? Uh, we're, we're, we're going about our business, we're doing everything like we normally do it, and sometimes we just flat out miss opportunities. Have you ever missed an opportunity and the Lord brought it to your mind later? Wow. If we're in tune with the Holy Spirit, he'll check us so that we slow down, that we take the opportunity. Many times that opportunity may not be uh, life, what we would think of as life-changing. It might be speaking a kind word to somebody. It might be helping somebody rather than walk by. Well, I'm too busy. I don't have time to do that. Right? Uh, it, I, it may be, it may be life changing. It may be amazing. A door that leads to other doors. Right? So, are we praying for the Lord to help us in? This
that manner. Uh, and may the Lord make you increase, verse 12, and abound in love to one another and to all. Praying for them to increase and abound in love. Wow. We need love, right? We need to love each other. We need to increase and abound. That word abound is like overflowing. Not, not just a little, but overflowing. So we need to abound in love for one another. There's a place in the Bible that tells us, by this you will know, they will know that you are my disciples in that you love one another. Right? That you love one another. It is the marker, the identification that you are the real deal if you love each other. Right? But this doesn't just stop there. Who else are we supposed to love? And to all. That might be a little harder. Is it a little harder? To be honest, it is, isn't it? Because it ain't most of the time. Some, sometimes y'all get on the nerves. But anyway, uh, most of the time it ain't too hard for me to love you all. I'm just joking with you all, by the way. Anyway. But it, it's pretty easy for me to love you all, right? Sometimes it's harder for me to love all. all because all means some of the people. All means most of the people. No, all means all of the people. <laughs> True. Some people are uh, easier to love than others. <laughs> so we are to abound in love. Uh, and we don't call it to love their personality. We call it to love them. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes we say to love their soul. And their soul is what really constitutes who they are. It, it, it's their makeup. It's who. It's, it's it's not just personality, but it's everything about them and who God made them to be, and all those things bundled together. So if we love their soul, uh, you know, most of the time that when Jesus was here on the earth, he didn't get on. I won't call them sinners as much as he did righteous and, and uh, religious leaders. Maybe they weren't righteous, right? Because of their lack of love for people. He said, you're, and can I, can Brian Roberts, unauthorized version. He said, you are shallow in your love if you only love those who love you. It takes greater love to love those who persecute you, those who are not friendly, those who uh, would that you just have odd against, right? Uh, so we don't want to have shallow love. We want to have love that is abounding, love that is overflowing. And Paul said, just as we do to you. So he said, I'm setting an example here. I love you. I really love you. As a matter of fact, I love you so much that you could follow my example of how to love people. Mm. Woo! Mm. That's a high standard, isn't it? That's the way, and that's where we ought to live. That people ought to see how to love people because they're seeing us. I don't know about you, but that kind of steps on my own toes. We want to we love, love, love people. Verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. This is foretelling of what he's going to talk about in the next chapter. He's saying, wow, this is so fitting. This week, how many times have 
If, if you're on Facebook at all, I promise you, you've probably seen posts that say, you need to take time right now. In light of what's going on in Israel, you need to take right, time right now to make sure that you're right with the Lord. Because the Lord could be coming any moment. Right? Any moment. <clears throat> and what is he saying? So that he, who's he, so that God may establish your hearts, make you blameless, make you in holiness before God. Not before man, but before God. Because God's standard is a whole lot higher than man's is. He really is. And if you don't think so, you can go to the jail and the people who are thieves treat people who are murderers worse than they would treat a thief. Because why? Because murderers are worse. That's what they that's what they think, right? I'm not saying we should murder. Uh, and I'm not saying we should steal. But we set standards of sin. This is worse than that. Right? But God's standard is way higher than any of us can meet. Yeah. So if you're trying to live by the law, and you mess up on one, you messed up on the whole law. That's what, that's what the Bible tells us, right? So may he establish your heart, making you blameless, making you holy before God. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. What he's saying, did you know Paul was also preaching that the Lord could come at any moment? It's a continuous running theme throughout the Bible. And we'll get on to closer than that. Yeah. I can't tell you when the Lord's coming, but I can tell you we're one day closer. <coughs> right? That's for sure. We're one day closer. So here he's saying, we want to get to you. We want to establish you. We want to make sure that you're standard, standing right before God because... The Lord could be coming back, right? He's coming back, and he's not just coming back by himself. With all his saints. I so much want to get into next week's thing, but I'm not going to. He's coming back. And he's not coming back alone. All those who have gone before. Coming back. With all of his saints. He's coming back with them. Uh, so let's kind of back up a little bit. Paul prayed throughout this whole last half of this chapter. He prayed for the Thessalonians. And he prayed some specific things. He prayed that he would be able to get to them benefit from him being there. Right? That's a, he didn't say that specifically, but that's why he wanted to be there. Right? He uh, prayed that they would abound in love and he prayed that they would be established in true holiness. Not just outward holiness. There's a difference. Jesus told the Pharisees who were so exclusive, they're like, we're going to make it so hard to follow after God that only us will really do it right. That's what they, I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that's what they thought. That's what they did. They took the law and they compounded it and made it even harder. And they said, we're going to make it so hard and so difficult and so intricate and so detailed that nobody's really going to be able to do it except us. And we're going to be set apart. And they did it not from an internal standpoint, but an external standpoint. And throughout the scriptures, throughout the gospel, Jesus says, 
He washed the outside of the cup. But the inside is still dirty. It's still dirty. I mean, Ellen wore several bottles today. And if I had just washed the outside and made her a bottle, that'd be gross, wouldn't it? But that's what Jesus said about them. He said, your holiness doesn't match up to God's standard. Because you're only worried about the outside. There were times in Pentecostal realms, and maybe there still, still are, are some that do this, where holiness was designated from an outward standard. And, and, and I understand that we ought to be set apart, but the set apart ought to be the heart and not the external. There are appropriate and inappropriate things to wear. I'm not saying there's not. But Jesus isn't going to come up and measure your skirt to see how far away it is from your knee. And he isn't going to measure your hair. Because he's concerned about the heart, right? Uh, and, and so there was a time when holiness movement was on that really wasn't getting to the heart of holiness. Because I'm not saying everybody was this way, but there were folks who were looking down at others because they didn't meet their standard. Right? Uh, and so, but can I tell you that we still have to be cautious that we don't do that. Because Somebody walked in here with a whole lot of tattoos and piercings and all that stuff. You have to be careful that we don't look at the external, but we really believe that God can change the heart. Because something happens when the internal begins to change, is then people begin to change their external as well. People do it. You don't clean them up. God does. Right? And so many times we are so bent out of shape by the things we see on the outside that we don't give people time, and God's working on them on the inside. We don't give people time, and we shun them, and we talk about them, and we don't do like what we don't, we don't have formed relationships with them because they're different than us, right? So uh, just... just we have to be cautious that we're not doing that. We want to treat them like we ought to. All right, let's go to the questions, and then I'll give time for a few minutes, a couple of minutes for any other uh, thoughts, comments, questions. Question number one. According to verse two, whom did Paul send to check on the Thessalonians? Sent Timothy. Question number two. According to verse two, what was Timothy's assignment? Two things. To what? Yeah. Establish and to encourage you concerning your faith. Right? Those two things. What was the per what was the purpose of Tim Timothy's assignment? According to verse three. won't be shaken by the afflictions that are happening to them, right? Verse, according to verse 4, what had Paul already told the Thessalonians? They would have tribulation. They would suffer persecution. According to verse 5, what was Paul's concern for the Thessalonians? That what? That Satan would tempt them. his work that it might be in vain. Right? Uh, according to verse 6, what news did Timothy bring back? Good news. 
part of that good news is they were continuing on in faith and love. And the other part was that they want to see us. Right? There's fellowship that they wanted to restore. Question number seven, according to verse 10. What was Paul praying for? This is just according to verse 10. Right, to see them and to perfect anything that was lacking in their faith. According to verse 12, what was Paul praying for? They would abound in love for who? For one another and all. Right? And then, according to verse 13, what was Paul's final part of his prayer? That God would do what? Establish them in true holiness. Coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all of us.